Uh, uh, call the meeting to order. Deb, would you please call roll? Councillor Buck is excused absent. Councillor Lenhart? Here. Councillor Harvey? Here. Councillor Cry? Here. Councillor O'Brien? Councillor Bremen? Here. All right, our next item, we've got a moment of silence and pledge of allegiance. If you'd all stand with us. Uh, we'd like to take a moment uh, for a moment of silence for all faiths and beliefs uh, to have a silent prayer. Thank you. If you'd please join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, we've got an agenda before us. Are there any changes to that agenda? No changes to the agenda, Mr. Mayor. All right, do we have a motion to approve the agenda? I move we uh, approve the agenda as presented. Councilor Bremen? Yes. Councilor Lenhart? Yes. Councilor Harvey? Yes. Councilor Cry? Yes. Councilor O'Brien? Yes. Motion passes 5 0. All right, we're going to move into our proclamations and presentations. Uh, so tonight we have a present our presentation is uh, Fruta Teachers and Student of the Month for March, and it, we've got Fruta Monument High School. So I'm going to come down front, and then we've got some people to recognize from Fruta Monument. Can help? Sure. All right, so this is the. One of the great things we get to do as a council is to get to recognize our local uh, teachers and students. And so uh, Fruit of Monument High School, I know we've got some people here and so we'd like to recognize them. Uh, and it looks like everybody is for an art show winner. So reading the notes, uh, they all were recognized nationally for, for their work. And so our first one is, uh, so when I call your name, if you'd come up here, we've got a certificate with a rec center pass. And then uh, Heather has a I love Fruta button for you as well. So um, our first one is Sarah Hill. And so she got a gold key for ceramics and glass. And then if you'd stay up here, because I'm sure there's some people that will want some photos. Um, next one is Ellie Lintot, and she got a gold key and silver key for drawing and illustration. Our next one is Oakley McCarver, uh, gold key in photography. Um, Hayden Murray, a gold key for mixed media. Honor Westcott, a silver key in mixed media. All right. I'll have one of the teachers take that back with you for him. Scarlett Montgomery Anderson, a silver key in painting. Bella Kinnick, a gold key in drawing and illustration. All right, and then we've got two teachers. Um, so we've got our art teacher, Tammy Wid Widhammer. And then we've got another art teacher, Nicole Sturrock. Good job. So if anybody wants to get any photos, now's the time. <laughs> you don't want to be in there? Yeah, let's stand up. And then while they're taking photos, I don't know if either one of the teachers want to say anything about this group of students. Very artistic. Yep. All right. Well, let's, let's give them another big round of applause. Yeah. 
You guys don't have to leave. You can stay for the fun part. <laughs> <laughs> All right, with that, we're gonna move into our public participation. So this is time that the council sets aside to listen uh, for comments from the public that are items that are not on our agenda. So if there's anybody in the audience that'd like to speak on something that's not on the agenda, now would be the time. If you'd please step up to the podium and state your name and address for the record. Michael Day, 1676 Fowler Drive. Right. Um, I just wanted to bring to the council's attention because the impression I got is that you guys were probably unaware. I, I did reach out to Mike about Excel's project with this power line. I hope you guys are on top of that. They've offered, uh, they came to a, uh, us in my neighborhood and I guess they, it was really more of a community focused meeting regarding our neighborhood and the people that lived in that area. Um, I wasn't able to attend because I was working. And the two folks that did attend um, uh, said that, you know, this, they were uh, concerned that the city wasn't uh, represented there uh, <clears throat> in regard to this proposal that Excel is doing, uh, wanting to move forward with. And there's quite a few concerns about the idea of the poles that they're uh, suggesting to put through a residential area. And um, from uh, my experience, you know, we've been putting these kind of things underground uh, for a number of reasons. Um, Excel's position at this time, I understand, is that it would be an expense of $10 million a mile to put it underground. Uh, they didn't indicate what the difference in the price was to go an alternate, one of the three alternate routes. However, I find that number a bit hard to appreciate considering that a proposal to put about a half a mile of this type of uh, power line underground in the same area came in at just under a million dollars. So, I mean, even if we went on the high side of a million dollars, uh, a half mile or $2 million a mile, we're still well under uh, 10 million, their $10 million suggestion that it would cost to put it underground per mile to finish their project. I hope that you guys are, um, have been updated. Mike did say he was going to reach out to the liaison uh, about it. And I think that it's important that we're aware of this and we kind of, we address this and see that it gets put underground for future generations that it will build and live in the area. All right, thank you, Michael. Is there anybody else in the audience that'd like to speak on something not on the agenda? All right, hearing none, I'm gonna close public participation and we're gonna move into the consent agenda. So these are all items where all conditions or requirements have been uh, agreed to or met prior to the time they come before council. They'll all be approved with one motion. So we're gonna open that up to public comment. If there's anybody in the audience that'd like to speak on something on the consent agenda, uh, now would be the time. Hearing none, I will close uh, public comment and bring it back to council. Are there any questions or do we have a motion? I, I mean, I, I don't, I would imagine there's other concern um, about the short-term rentals. Um, I don't know if what the, the appetite for further discussion is on that, but I have concerns with that and I'd like to pull it off the the consent agenda. Okay, we can do that. So then we pull that off and put that under our council reports and actions, correct? Or do we put that under our um, administrative agenda? Was, can I speak, Mr. Mayor? Yeah. Was this just to set the hearing to have that conversation? This yes, isn't- that's what, that's approve. all you're approving is- This is to have the, the hearing. hearing. It's not an approval of anything but setting the hearing to have a, a discussion as, as directed by council at the workshop. Regard. All right, okay. and we won't pull it. Take that from the record. <laughs> Let's pretend that didn't yeah. happen. Yeah. Redact that. I have such okay. a good record. <laughs> any, <laughs> any other questions, Kyle? Oh, or, would, things off yeah. <laughs> or would you like to make a motion? <laughs> <laughs> I'll move that we approve the consent agenda 
as presented. I'll second. Councilor Lenhart? Yes. Councilor Harvey? Yes. Councilor Cry? Yes. Councilor O'Brien? Yes. Councilor Breeman? Yes. Motion passes 5 0. All right. With that, uh, we do not have any public uh, hearings tonight, so we're going to move into our administrative agenda. So our first item is a presentation from Region 10 on broadband efforts uh, in the partnership with the City of Fruta. Thank you, uh, Mayor, members of Council. Um, it's, uh, I'm pleased to introduce uh, Corey Brindell with Region 10 uh, to give us a, a, an update on, on the project that we are partnering with Region 10 on uh, to complete Middle Mile in Fruta. I feel like that's echoing quite a bit. <clears throat> okay, and uh, so uh, on the consent agenda, uh, you approved an adjustment to the budget for the grant that was already uh, in our work plan for the year uh, and in, in the budget to uh, increase that amount so that we can apply to Department of Local Affairs uh, to uh, obtain funding uh, to match our ARPA funds uh, to complete Middle Mile. and. Um, so we invited Corey to come and speak to council, as mentioned at the workshop uh, last week, to give just an overview of, of what that means, how we're, how we're approaching it, and how that benefits the community. But also, most importantly, if you have questions uh, to ask, uh, Corey's a wealth of knowledge. He's been a great partner to work with and uh, very helpful. And just before he steps up to the podium to, to give his presentation, I'll just remind um, uh, each of you and, and those in the audience that the state is funding through Department of Local Affairs, uh, Region 10, to work with Western Slope communities to do just what we are working on, and, that, and that's the connection there. Region 10 is not uh, an ISP or a, a, a private provider at the end for service, but helping us create open access opportunities to have multiple providers, including existing providers, to be able to utilize that network and increase speeds and offer and and offerings to our residents and businesses. So, um, yeah, Corey, we'd love to have you. Uh, if, you if you don't mind stepping up to the, uh, the podium, and and Corey has some slides that he'll show. And Hello. Hello. Good. Okay. Thanks for having me tonight. Appreciate it. Been working with the guys for a while here. And I don't want to go too heavy on the slides, but I do want to share a few key items. Um, sorry. All right. Now we're good. So I'm Corey Brindle. Uh, I work with Region uh, 10 down in Montrose. I live up in Crested Butte, Colorado, and kind of been at the rural broadband thing for, gosh, a decade or more. Uh, started working in uh, around Durango and helped with Silverton significantly. Just made incremental improvements over the years. Uh, Virgil Turner had uh, had the director seat before myself, and good friends with Virgil helped helped out with various things over the years. Um, I wear two hats. Um, one is with Region 10. The other is with the Department of Local Affairs, where I provide technical assistance to communities to do the types of things that we're talking about here. Um, I'm going to move through a couple slides. This is not a technical presentation. This is a concept presentation. <laughs> um, so a couple just basic uh, level sets. Uh, middle mile and last mile. Middle mile is a term that you hear around grant funding that means fiber between cities, between communities. So you bring in services from Denver or Salt Lake or uh, Albuquerque, out, out to other areas. That's middle mile. Last mile is typically from a distribution center in a city out to subscribers, people who are ratepayers or buying service from an IS, private ISP typically. Um, there's three key areas that we focus on in, in rural broadband. Redundant, abundant, and affordable. We can all repeat that over and over. Those three words are the most important. Um, redundancy means uh, not that we're duplicating efforts, but that we have the ability to take a failure. Um, so we have geographic redundancy. If services go down in one area, they stuff, stay up in the, area, the other side of the equation. Um, we have three internet drains, one to Denver, one to Salt Lake, one to Albuquerque, that if we lose one, the other two stay up and, and functioning. Not every network is like that. We try to reduce single points of failure. You know, Any cable, any piece of equipment, any power supply that can go down, we try to make sure there's redundancies there. Uh, abundant, um, that means capacities. When your ISP 
locally in the town can't buy enough upstream service from the metro areas. They can't feed it to the subscribers. And it's very expensive. It's a big part of the equation that makes the networks work. So we really want to increase capacities and bring those on par with what you have in the metro areas. If you're south of Boulder, if you're in Highlands Ranch, those fiber to the home networks have a lot of capacity. If you're 250 miles away from the, the nearest 50,000 person population center, you really lack capacity. Uh, cost and affordability is the next one. We want to make sure that the cost that your subscribers are paying for like services out in the rural areas are exactly what we're paying in the city. So that equity. Corey, are those supposed to be changing? That's my question. Yeah, it didn't change. Anything. It didn't change up there. So just, I, I mean, you're going through this and I'm like, okay, that. <clears throat> all right. Just, all right, just to make sure we're on the same page. Yeah. <laughs> we want the service to stay up and working. We want to have speeds and lots of it. And we want people to be able to access the services and, and get, you know, get use of them. Um, so this is kind of like flying over Colorado at night. Um, these are the, the four primary fiber routes that Region 10 is working on, um, east to west across I-70, uh, gaining, uh, we own part of the PathNet route from Grand Junction down to Durango. We're gonna have to do some construction between Durango and Walsenburg to make that route occur, and Denver to Walsenburg is in place today. So around that ring, we can endure a failure and we can keep uh, all the remaining areas up once the Durango piece is built. Uh, Frida, sitting out here on our Salt Lake uh, spur. So we have fiber that was installed by uh, Zeo out of Boulder and with their partner is CDOT on that. And uh, that fiber sitting out here, those two vaults up on the highway, went out and got some photos of those today. Um, this kind of shows our three internet drains, Albuquerque, Salt Lake, and Denver. So, so one example that I've been using around the state, is we're also working with Palisade. Palisade is sitting out there, much like Fruita is. Um, there are 3,000 people. Uh, their, their median income is about half of what the state's average is. They're not a place that's a candidate for the cable companies or the telcos to invest. Um, it's very difficult to get a large company to invest in a low-density area. So along comes the new fiber on I-70. And as that fiber arrives, we want to make use of it. So what do we do? We build a spur. We build what we call lateral fiber over to a little building. And that little building, I came up with this name, a carrier neutral location, a place where multiple ISPs can occupy with their equipment in there and have access to the upstream fiber. Um, this is kind of the inside of a carrier neutral location. They're roughly 10 by 20 feet. They have a bunch of racks, redundant power. The one in Telluride there you can see has redundant air conditioning in it. Access control, it's basically a clean environment. They're not large. Um, this is sort of the floor plan. Um, it's all techy, but it's really not. On the far right side, there's three uh, racks with those white rectangles for last mile providers. On the other side, two middle mile providers that have racks. Uh, we lease out that rack space and make it uh, attractive for ISPs to occupy. Um, this is a, a All right, so this is how we make it work for each of the small towns. I've got 14 communities I'm working with from Glenwood all the way out to Fruita in, in this section of the state. Um, we provide an east and a westbound path. So if there's a mudslide in the canyon towards Denver, you'll have a path towards Salt Lake or towards Albuquerque to keep the services up and going. We include some optical equipment to transport the signals in and out of the town, and we put a little bit of a, a router, an edge router in there. Uh, that allows us to make some traffic decisions east and west. Why do we do this? Um, why are we spending public dollars on internet infrastructure? Won't the private companies all do this? We want to attract their investment. We want a fiber to the home provider to come here, line out the town, compete with um, other incumbents, create a competitive environment. We want wireless internet service providers, whether they're here already or new ones, to serve the peripheral areas of the town and, and put up a tower or two or use an existing tower. We want the mobile providers, uh, the folks that are cellular service to come in and as 5G, 6G, the next thing comes out, we want to put additional antennas around and make those services work well. And lastly, the community anchor institutions need service. Um, the city, county, uh, healthcare, education, all the usual CAIs. Um, this slide kind of shows everything outside of the shaded gray box above it and, and to the right of it is all public dollars and public investment. Um, everything in the gray box is private dollars and private investment. And these are public dollars supporting private investment in your community. 
we're not trying to become your ISP. We're not trying to replace your current providers. We're trying to help support them in your existing environment. So just to review, middle mile fiber comes along the highway or we build it if it's not, not coming on its own. In this case, it came on its own with CDOT. Uh, we build the lateral fiber into the town. We put the small room, the CNL together. This works in Palisade. This works in Pagosa Springs as we build fiber along 160 and put a CNL down in Pagosa. We just funded that. Uh, Bayfield works down in Bayfield as well. Works in Fruta. So this is uh, basically bringing the, the fiber across and then over into the CNL. How does Fruta fit into the larger picture? These are each regions of the state. Um, there's a broadband middle mile project called Project Thor that's all um, run by the Northwest COG. Nate Wallowitz is the leader of that project and that's just made huge inroads into the communities in the central part, north central part of the state. Um, these are the communities, a few others too, but that I'm working with. Um, we, we've been funded to build this backbone to support Glenwood, Newcastle, Silt Rifle, Parachute, Quebec, Palisade, Clifton, we're working on a proposal to get all the way down into Colburn and the Plateau Valley, Grand Junction, and from day one, we built in Fruta as one of the participating communities. And Mike and um, Shannon have been very helpful with that. Uh, down through the Region 10 area, uh, Virgil had done past seven or eight years of work. He's brought on Delta, Hotchkiss, Montrose, all the central communities. I'm out here in the sticks in Crested Butte. We've got mountains on three sides of us and we're working on 32 miles of fiber to come up from Highway 50 there. Uh, down in the Southwest Cog in Durango, Cortez has been very active. Um, the Southwest had a lot of islands of fiber where they had made investments in the towns, but they had never tied the towns together. So now we're taking the opportunity that the funding's around to tie those towns together. So you see the statewide ring around the state, you see these different regions um, west of I-25 and I'm just trying to bring optical services to the outlying Glad to take any questions and thanks for working with us. Thank you, Corey. Does anybody mm. have any questions for Corey? <laughs> so the neutral uh, location that's going to be built on, on Fruta property. Is that what we're looking at? Yeah, we want that to be truly a neutral facility, both, both the cable and the, uh, the building itself. So any ISP is comfortable coming into there. We lease out this space. So we basically do a lease back uh, to manage the space for you. And then we lease out that space at very low rates, um, $250 per rack, which is almost nothing. Um, the idea is to create that environment where the ISPs can come in and, and put their equipment and start to build up. Okay. We've had four separate internet service providers starting to look at and review both Fruta and Palisade. Mm. We're getting calls weekly, and I want to have this core infrastructure in place for each of the communities before we start entertaining proposals on Fruta. Yeah. Right. You had a question? No, I just wanted to say thank you. That was yeah. very thorough for the lay person. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, that, no, that was right at this level. That was great. Yeah. <laughs> the second presentation was your gift. <laughs> I'm ready. I'm ready. Thanks for your time. I appreciate you guys. Actually, Corey, can I uh, ask a question? Yep. yep. Which is after uh, the, the neutral location is built, in your experience, how long has it take taken for ISPs? to kind of take that middle, that neutral location and then bring it out to the homes in a community. Is that a two year process? It varies um, mm -hmm. as expected, but, but it really is a function of access to capital. So what I'm seeing in the current round is the home providers that are approaching the communities. Some of them have private equity, private capital, and they're able to work pretty quickly. Some of them want to match private capital with the coming federal dollars. Mm -hmm. And some of them are matching private capital with state public dollars. Um, it depends on which model that they're doing. There are availability issues with fiber cabling. There is labor issues, you know, challenges getting, getting staff. Mm -hmm. So we've got a little bit of a headwind, but we've got guys who are pretty aggressive and trying to move. I don't know if I could uh, nail an exact time frame to it. Um, it comes down to how much encumbrance that they see. Um, if you've got rivers and Chippewa area, sensitive areas, uh, environmental concerns, all, all those things that can be longer. If you're simply plowing or drilling through sidewalks and streets, you know, the, the green areas in front of homes and behind businesses, it can go pretty quickly. Um, 
So I, it's a multi-year project at minimum. Okay. Um, in, in a year, you could probably see two phases built depending on product and labor availability. To get to full build out, it would be more than two summers. Yeah, thank you. And Grand Junction's, you know, wrestling with the same thing on a much larger scale. And I'm trying to bring the optical service to the outlying community. Is that something like Isaiah would come in and build out those that fiber to the homes? Or do they only deal with like, you know, middle mile? Yeah, Zayo is probably not a candidate to build fiber to the home. They're one, a partner that we work with on middle mile stuff. Okay. Like on that um, 160 build, we'd like them to participate in building a long haul piece. They tend to focus more on businesses and ISPs. Um, they see this route across I-70 not as serving the communities. We've kind of changed some minds to get to that point. They really saw this as a long haul route, a protect path to get to Salt Lake. So the communities along the way are interesting, but not smaller than their typical scale. Gotcha. You, you get an occasional ISP that's larger that they'd like to talk to, but an ISP that's serving 500, 800 folks doesn't buy enough capacity. Uh, they would entertain a, a proposal for those folks, but it just doesn't happen that often. Um, so yeah, that, there's other outfits that are maybe a little more um, adventurous okay. that, that we'd be looking at. Thanks. Oh, well, mm -hmm. my contacts there, feel free to ask. Thanks, guys, for the time. Thank you. All right, thank you, Corey. That was good. All right, with that, we're going to move into our city manager's report. Thank you, uh, Mayor, members of council. Uh, just two updates tonight. One is uh, this morning we had a, a Fruit of Mountain Property and Mountain Water uh, Partners meeting. So we invited a number of uh, partners. Uh, we, if you remember, we one of our goals prior to the pandemic was to start reaching out and trying to develop what kind of partnerships we can develop in order to maintain public access and not lose that public access, but look at more effective ways to manage those properties that are you know over an hour away from the city. And uh, we had, uh, you know, those, we had some good starts to those. And then when the pandemic hit, it was very difficult to get many of those agencies together. So we did that today and we had about 30 people at the community center representing various public entities, the county, uh, Colorado Parks and Wildlife, uh, U.S. Forest Service, uh, the Bureau of Land Management, uh, private, uh, uh, private landowners up on Glade Park that also have call rights to the water. Um, uh, some of the owners that have funded projects in the past that the city owes shares of water to on an annual basis. Um, we had uh, some of the inspectors. So it was a, it was a great diverse group uh, to just start brainstorming uh, ways we can look at some of what are the, what are the opportunities, what are the challenges and then we developed some subcommittees uh, to look into some of the specific challenges that were brought up. Um, definitely be, uh, during the pandemic, uh, usage up there from a recreational basis has, you know, no surprise, but it's, it's more than quadrupled up there. And a lot, of the, a lot of the issues are not necessarily occurring on City of Fruta land, but it's City of Fruta land that has the amenities that bring a lot of people there, but then lots of um, not even uh, they wouldn't even define it as dispersed camping but long-term living essentially in some of these areas it's causing you know a lot of vandalism up there that's causing a lot of um, uh, you know impairments to the public lands and and damage uh, to the public assets so that was one one area and then there were and then there's the there were uh, sub there's a subcommittee to work on just some of the the, the flow of water and and how all those partners are utilizing that. Um, if you remember, every six years we have to justify our usage to to maintain those rights. And while those that water is not possible to be used in the city any longer and hasn't been since the 80s, it is what provides uh, non potable water to about 50 users on Glade Park, right? And so that's that's a partnership we have where they maintain some of that line. So anyway, uh, it was a great uh, kickoff to uh, to some more discussions with partners and we'll keep you updated on on that. Um, I don't know if there's any questions on that, but just, just wanted to give you a quick update on that. Um, the second is uh, we are 
related to what Corey just uh, just presented on, we are working with all of our partners in Mesa County related to coordination for last mile. Um, and that's, that's, that's a bit of a, a moving target for everybody because different communities are at a different stage for middle mile. Um, but we're making sure that we're communicating and, and each group is working with region 10 as well. So there's coordination on that end. Uh, but we are all being uh, more aggressively than ever before because of a lot of funding that's available for last mile, being contacted regularly by these private providers that are interested in getting in and, and, and building out. The challenge that we have to be mindful of and, and that, this, that this middle mile project will help us be able to negotiate more effectively is uh, making sure that we have kind of an even playing field for the for the last mile and and the negotiating power to uh, enter into agreements for last mile that also first focus on the mo more difficult areas to serve rather than you know last mile just rolling out to the easy areas to serve which is typically what what can occur um, so the middle mile piece will put us in a, a much better position of that we recently had a meeting with the other cities and the county uh, to hear a proposal from a company that actually does not is not an ISP or a, a provider, but they actually build uh, last mile networks in communities and then lease out to multiple providers. So you have one build to every residence and business, um, and they have some unique strategies for deploying that that our all of our public works and engineering departments are, are going to be meeting on. So there's a lot of work being done. Um, we're not quite there to that point of last mile until we finish the project that we have uh, underway. Um, but we are we are doing a lot of research and coordination on the best way to begin that process um, when we get to that point. So um, and that's all I have for tonight. All right, thanks, Mike. Um, all right, we're going to move into our council reports and actions. Our first item is the cancellation of the regular March City Council workshop. We did do a special workshop for the last week in March. So this is just our regular fourth Tuesday that we were going to cancel. Any questions on that one? Or do we have a motion to cancel the March meeting? Cancellation of the Tuesday, March 22nd workshop meeting for the Cuda of uh, City of Cuda. Councillor Harvey? Yes. <clears throat> Councillor Cry? Yes. Councillor O'Brien? Yes. Councillor Bremen? Yes. Councillor Linhart? Yes. We should pass this 5 0. All right. And we're going to move into our uh, reports. So who, who wants to start? My meetings are forthcoming. So. All right. And Ken? Uh, AGNC met last week. We had an update from the workforce centers from around the region. Um, we have both the economic development district director and AGNC director both retiring. They're hiring new folks to fill those positions. The next meeting's in Grand Junction. So if anybody wants to come, uh, come. I think it's March 16th. I think that's right. Um, uh, you can get on AGNC's website or I can RSVP for you. Uh, they meet in the morning, don't they? Yeah, it usually goes like from like nine until one. They provide lunch. <laughs> um, uh, also, um, are we having? I don't know yet. Oh, right. Something good. <laughs> uh, uh, Colorado National Monument Association is. They have their uh, an annual plain air event where they have artists from all over come and paint. Uh, this year they're having a special um, art show at the art center where they invite those artists to do larger studio pieces based on their inspiration here. So that art opening is Friday at 7 p.m. at the art center. That's all I got. All right, thank you, Ken. Kyle? Meetings are forthcoming, so nothing to report right now. All right, Karen? Same here. All right, Matthew. Uh, GGF has a, uh, that meeting's forthcoming. I did go on the uh, Grand Junction Chamber Ledge trip. So I've been doing those about every other year for the past 10 years. Uh, just one thing of note, um, I think this year it was fairly obvious uh, that they truly didn't understand uh, the Western Slope. There were comments made uh, even to, well, people in Denver should move out to Grand Junction, Western Slope area where there's plenty of affordable housing. Who are all like, 
are you talking about? <laughs> so there is uh, some continues to be some disconnect there. All right, thank you. Um, I've just got a couple things. Um, I was uh, at the coffee and community event that the chamber put on last week, and they had more res reservations than what showed up, so they kind of combined the groups together because that was a snow day. Remember, we got like a half inch of snow. So, um, so I was put in with Ute Water, which so it was kind of interesting because we had several conversations with the community about the property up there and, and Ute's history. I can't remember, Mike, when we did a tour on that, and I was thinking after a new council comes on, we may want to do that again um, of their facility because uh, they do, they service a lot of the community, like 75% of the community, Grand Junction, they're not in that, but all the surrounding areas. So that was good to be at that, uh, just to kind of fill people in on what's happening in our community and learn a little bit too about some of that. Um, the Fruit of Tourism Advisory Council met last week, and so Colvita has started working uh, for us. They did a survey um, and got respondents, and so they're in the process of putting all that together uh, for us. The other thing that they're working on is um, costs and, and what, the, um, what it's going to take to rebuild the tourism website, uh, and so uh, what the best route of that is. And so I know the FTAC is going to be working with them kind of to probably bring council something. We've got in the budget $10,000 for rebuild. Um, but we're not sure, they're not sure that they can hit that at this point. So we're going to have some future discussions and it may come to council, um, depending on that. So that is all I have for my reports uh, for tonight as well. So uh, with that, we are going to adjourn at 7.38 p.m. We've got, we're supposed to start our workshop at 7.45. So we've got just a little bit of a break in here. Alrighty, alrighty then.